long ago is it since a picture like this would have been either abhorred or ridiculed. But today, the education of small children in methods of self-preservation is recognized as a humane proceeding. U.S. citizen returning to the United States in the previous 14 days will be subject to up to 14 days of mandatory quarantine. call-in show. This is Laura Grant with Timothy Lovett, and we are missing Kim DeShield, but we do, we do have some carsick Lauren Kaling, and our special guest, Ms. Wendy Liebman. Woo! I'm yes. wearing the same jacket that I had in that picture. I apologize. Well, it's I washed, continuity. It's continuity. I washed it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got a brand. You got to maintain it. <laughs> Well, we lost our power the other day. Like we woke up and there was no power and, um, and, and we had paid the bill. So I right. didn't, it was the <laughs> whole street, but I was going to um, iron this. And then I realized I don't own an iron. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I saw that you lost your power and I was like, wait, we lost our power here because of a tropical storm. But why did you lose your power? Who knows? Um, I know that they lost their power in New York City as well. Yeah. So maybe it's just it's the a power outage. Maybe it's so hot people are using a lot of air conditioning or I don't know. My theory is that New York found you somehow, I just think. But <laughs> I don't York know. found you me and oh. made sure you lost it too right <laughs> wendy well, we, started out yeah go ahead i'm sorry no we got it back so we're all good i'm happy i'm happy to hear that um i i wanted to start by introducing you uh like many of us the young folks may not know like folks who didn't have only hbo at some point in their lives and knew how there was this big poverty of real co comedy on tv until we had HBO's Women of the Night, which is the thing that really got me connected to you. I was just like, this woman has the best timing, the best timing. And, and like I always tell people, like that, that is an ultimate for me because you, you lay out your jokes, you set them up, you punch, and then it's like tagging, next thing, next thing, tag, tag. And I have never seen anybody do that so consistently and constantly like I've seen you do. Thank you. Now, you were only in for a few years at that point. So can you tell us a little bit about when you started out? Well, comedy time is not real time. Like, I think I had been doing it for about eight years by then, which seems like a lot, but it really, in comedy time, it's nothing. And I think it took me like 13 years or 14 years to get comfortable on stage. But I started in the mid 80s. I took a class. Uh, I took the course catalog uh, for the Cambridge Center for Adult Education. Uh, I took it from the wrong apartment. Like it was sitting on the floor in our apartment building and I thought it was for us. And, um, but it was for the apartment downstairs. Anyway, I read the catalog and I thought I'm gonna take an acting class because I'd always done a lot of theater in high school growing up in camp I was always like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz or um, Eliza in My Fair Lady so I had that background so I took the acting class and the teacher quit in during the break mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so the Cambridge Center for Adult Ed and this is in Boston Boston Cambridge um, they said take another class so I'm looking at the catalog and I see how to be a stand-up comedian. How I missed that the first time around, I don't know, because when I saw how to be a stand-up comedian, it was like my life changed. I heard like, ha ah, ha, ah, like the angels, and like, oh my God, that's me. And I took the class and then a couple of years later, I, uh, like I performed in Boston and like Boston, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Rhode Island. I would drive every night 
to some gig and then I would be back at my day job in the morning. So I did that for six years and then I moved out to LA. And uh, so that's my start. Oh, you're muted. Laura, you're muted. Thank you. I can't even, I can't even <laughs> monitor myself. I am so out of control right now. By the way, I just want to tell you, Kim DeShields, who can't be here right now, says that you're one of her favorites, of course. Oh. But she, we love you. But anyway, you. Go, yes, she's, she's a fan. Um, but I wanted to say, what was, your, what was your day job at that point? So I had three jobs after college. I was going to be, a, I, was, I studied psychology in college. And I was planning on being a therapist. Um, so my first job was at Mass Mental Hospital. I did psych research. And I realized I felt so crazy there. Like I didn't think I could handle it. So I then took a job at a publishing company, One Beacon Street at Houghton Mifflin doing, um, it was the reference division. I was the secretary to the publisher. Like we literally decided, we, he did what words to put in the dictionary. Wow. And then I was like, this isn't for me. And I saw the guys moving up and I, it was like unfair. Mm -hmm. So um, I then found a job at Radcliffe College as the assistant to the director of a fellowship program for women. So it was 40 women in residence and it was like a think tank for women. And we had like brilliant mathematicians and artists and I was just around such genius. Um, and I did that for six years before I moved to LA. Wow. And when you moved to LA, did you go full-time comedy? So yes, I made a decision. I, I never wanted to be the starving artist. So that's why I had my day job all those years while I did comedy. And I guess I saved up enough money. I realized when my, I was getting paid more for my avocation, my, you know, my, my hobby, comedy, as I was making at Radcliffe, I decided to um, quit my day job and move to LA. And ironically, when I moved to LA, that's when I started going on the road because I had only ever been on the road one time, um, even though I did all those gigs in the surrounding um, states, I had never like gone on a gig, like driven or flown. But one time I went to New Jersey I was performing at Catch a Rising Star. It was at like a Hilton or a Sheridan in Princeton, New Jersey. And I was opening for a comedian who had been doing stand up for like four months, but he was headlining because he was so good. And his name is John Stewart. No way. Uh, four months and already yeah, headlining. That's yeah. a story. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel like I've talked too much. No, this is oh. what we want. This is oh, exactly okay. why you're here. Okay. Can, we, can we talk a little bit before? I am excited to hear about how you, your process came along, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your upbringing in New York. You're from Roslyn, right? I'm from Roslyn. It's a suburb on Long Island in Nassau County. And they made a movie called Bad Education on HBO recently. Um, and it was about my high school, although it happened many years later. It wow. Was, they embezzled like millions of dollars. Oh, yeah. superintendent. Did you see it, Tim? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The superintendent. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah had it, embezzled all this money. And people are like, how did they not recognize that it was gone? Like, you would have <laughs> recognized $50 gone from any other school. But um, wow. yeah, so it was, uh, I was always in the plays there, as I said. And um, what else about my childhood? I never ran away when I was little. Although one time I asked everybody else in the house to move out. That's so, yeah. so great. I was <laughs> That's my say, favorite joke that I ever wrote. Great joke. It's a great joke. <laughs> were, your, were your family funny? Was it, was it a funny family that kind of bred up the, you know, the jokes and the sort of sharpness that you have, you know? That's such a good question. Like, um, I guess my mother is very clever. 
and creative. She ran a preschool for 20 years and works in early childhood education. And um, my dad was in the insurance business. And all I can say is all those ads on TV, Progressive and Geico, they all try to be funny. So maybe there's something inherently funny about insurance. But um, I guess I guess everybody was humorous. And my sister's really funny. She is a therapist. And uh, so, yeah, there was a lot of humor in my house. But there was also a lot of, I don't want to say sadness, but... Um, I was depressed for sure. And a lot of depressed people become comedians. I know that's true. Yep. Um, I think at the time when I took the class, I was very depressed. And um, I, at the time I thought I would rather laugh with a hundred people than cry by myself. So laughing really did I don't want to say cure me but laughing really does help when you're depressed because I I think laughing and humor it's a way out it's mm -hmm. like you're not so stuck and um it's another perspective it's I a just concept. spit on myself <laughs> oh but <laughs> That makes me happy. I don't know why. I don't know why. Yeah, that's definitely you, another perspective. You're so human. <laughs> I agree with you. I think, and this is a common theme that comes up, and I'm a psychologist by trade, so you should that's know right. that. So I know that for myself, that comedy has saved my life, and, and I don't want to speak for anybody else here, but I know there's a couple of us who feel the same way. Um, in your family, did you... Did they recognize depression? Did they recognize mental illness? Because a lot of times we grow up in families that don't believe in mental illness, that it exists or um, that we should do anything about it. That's, uh, again, a really good question. Both my parents were psychology majors, but my mother to this day has never been to therapy and doesn't have any problems as far of course. as she, she can see. Um, my dad was in therapy when he was a little boy, but, um, and we went to family therapy like a few times early on. Um, and that's when I first learned that like the family, that the, whatever mental illness is, is like a family issue. Like there are, you're not just alone. So, um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're muted. I did it again. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you answered it because okay. you were saying that your family yeah. does sort of see it. Um, and that's, yeah. that's awesome. And I noticed now because you do these, um, you do the daily update and there was a period of time when you were doing a number, I think, I forget what the number of times it would be, but you were talking about how stand up has taught you about it can be translated into normal life. And I feel like when I watch your daily updates, it's often like a, a session. It's like um, oh. motivational or just connection. And I see you that way. I like, so mm -hmm. I see you as kind of doing that work, but in this sort of comedic way, if that makes any sense. Well, during the pandemic, I am trying to think of other income sources as we all are, because it's, especially if you're in the arts, it's like, what the fuck? Like, um, so I've been doing some Zoom shows, but I also thought like, what, what else could I do? And um, I, one of my crazy thoughts was I could like do therapy with people, even though I don't have a degree. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, I, I decided not to do that unless anybody here want, wants that. But um, I might call you. Actually. Oh, OK. <laughs> but uh, a lot of therapy, I think, is listening, being a really good listener and what I appreciate about all of my therapists not i don't have a lot now i don't mean i have them at the same time <laughs> you have a team. i mean over the years yeah i have a team of therapists um that's a michael lee joke michael lee was a comedian in boston and he said uh i'm in group therapy it's me and six therapists <laughs> i love that joke um but what i appreciate is when they remember things and can synthesize like they put together patterns and so anyway 
Um, I didn't become a therapist, but I think a lot of comedians are intuitive. Um, yeah. This is like group therapy right now. It is. Doesn't it feel kind of like seven of us? <laughs> it feels way better than my work meeting. So that's all I got to say. What kind of what? What's the population that you work with? Veterans. I work for oh. um, with veterans. So, God yeah. bless you. Oh. oh, God bless them. They have to put up with me. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I wanted to. So I'm sorry. I, this is about you. You know that, right? So I'm going to keep veering back on you. Okay. Um, so how did you develop this pattern that you have? It's it's to me it seemed very unique at the time. The, my my comedy style. Yes, yeah. So, okay. So I, I, I watch the comedians around me, um, like the comedy in the comedy clubs, such as Brian Kiley, who is now Conan O'Brien's head writer, um, Jonathan Katz, who created Dr. Katz Professional Therapist. Speaking of therapy. Uh, Lenny Clark, Don Gavin, Kevin Meany, the late great Kevin Meany, um, Laura Keitlinger, um, and I heard their comedy, and I remember watching Kevin Meany one night, and he never had like a lull, there was never a lull, and I thought, I want to do that, and um, before I continue with this, I want to say that I was watching I would watch Paula Poundstone because she's from the Boston area. I think she's from Boston. And she, I remember watching her and going, why am I even doing stand up? Like, I'm never going to be this good. And then I thought, you know what? I can be my amount of good. Like, it's not a comparison. She's amazing, but I don't have to aspire to be her. I can aspire to be my best me. Um, and I have to remind myself of that a lot. But back to my style. So I remember being on stage and I said something like, I'm a writer, I write checks. And then, <laughs> and then that got like a laugh and then there was a lull. And, and I, I swear, I just think I don't like being on stage in silence. Mm -hmm. And then I said, so I would add something like they're mostly fiction. So it was, it came out of not wanting to be quiet. And, you know, now I'm thinking back to my family. I don't think my mother liked silence. There always has to be somebody talking. Huh. So that's really interesting. Wow, how much do I owe you, Laura? Nothing. Grant? This is everything. <laughs> it's a little, so it sounds like it's based a little bit on anxiety, maybe. Yeah. And well, plus when you're on stage by yourself, there's already anxiety. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I'm finding Zoom very interesting because when I do a Zoom show, I'm giving something away. I can cheat and have like my jokes on the side. So uh, I don't have to feel as anxious that I'm going to forget what I'm going to say. It's like having a cue card. Um, but I do think my, so my style was born out of listening to other people who were performing at the same time. Plus I watched all the other comedians, um, Gary Shandling and David Letterman and, Joan Rivers, Phyllis Stiller, um, uh, who else? I don't know. Who are some of the comedians you like, Tim? <laughs> okay, well, I like, you know, of course, <laughs> I like the greats, you know, I mean, I like, you know, Dave Chappelle, Eddie Murphy, but I really do. I love female comics. I love female comedy. I think female comedy is always better for me because they always come from a perspective where I can't write from, where I don't look at the world. Uh, you know, as such, so, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh my God, why didn't I think of that? Oh, right, because I couldn't. Because you have a penis. Right, no. right, I didn't want to, <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but you know. <laughs> she did it again, though, she did it again. She pushed on to you. But you know, what I was noticing about what you were saying was that you were naming a lot of male comics and not a lot of female comics. And for me, that is true. Like there weren't a lot of female comics, it, you know, that whole, 
that whole like myth that women aren't funny and getting stuck on a bill, a special novelty bill or one every 20, you know? So I really appreciated you at that point. And uh, because you were, like I, like I said before, like Phyllis Diller and Joan Rivers were really it, Moms Mabley. And then I saw Marsha Warfield. And, but yes. I really, when I saw you, I, you know, those were great, but you, it was like, that one, Women of the Night Show, I keep going there because it's just so important to me that it was like you and Rita Rudner and Susie oh. Essman and Judy Gold, like all these people. Um, oh my God, I'm reading Judy Gold's book right now. Are you? I heard it's good. What yes. It it's read? called Yes, I Can Say That. See that? Another yes book. <laughs> and that there is a theme oh, going on. Oh, that's right. We got the yes. year of yes and yes, I can say that. Well, awesome. Judy is she's a force to reckon with. I love her so much. Um, and Rita Rudner is the hardest working comedian I know still. She's genius. Um, yeah, I remember at the time in Boston, I worked with, there were three, primarily three or four female stand-ups who were like in the class ahead of me. And it was Linda Smith, who now teaches stand-up in New York City. Um, not you, Linda Smith. Not the other Linda Smith. <laughs> How weird is that? That is weird. <laughs> um, a woman named Jennifer Hogue, who then transitioned into becoming like a cabaret singer and unfortunately passed away. There was um, Lauren Dombrowski, who then went on to write from like Run Mad TV and then unfortunately passed away. And Julie Barr, who is still performing. Um, per she's still performing. So yeah, there were just a handful of women in Boston. Oh, and Cindy, uh, Cindy Freeman, who now does burlesque in New York City. Wow. And she was she was a great stand-up comedian, and I guess she's a great burlesque performer. That's amazing. I yeah. mean, and you know, you're naming people that most of us haven't heard, like they're not, like a, right. the newer generation of people don't know those names. Um, but one name that I forgot to mention before was Whoopi Goldberg, who was also somebody I was mad, like yes. this person becomes characters. And that was like another one. And you worked with Whoopi on at least at Comic Relief, but I'm sure you did other things with her as well. I did one uh, benefit for her about 20 years ago uh, with Caroline Ray, who I'm such a fan of, another oh, female comedian. Um, and Whoopi was, I mean, Whoopi was all, already on The View at that time, I think, but uber famous and just so down to earth, like such a sweetheart. Yeah, excuse me, it's not COVID. Yeah, okay, whatever you say, you stay Although where you the are. Other day, the other day I was nervous because I couldn't smell or taste my food. And they say, you know, that's like a, a symptom of mm -hmm. the virus and I couldn't smell or taste anything. And then I took off my mask. <laughs> that's funny <laughs> oh my gosh so i mean you did the tonight show you've done countless things what are some of the most like memorable experiences on stage that you would think of when we talk about this stuff so i've had two my two favorite shows i think well i've had three one on my 50th birthday which was about nine years ago now i rented a theater and i taped a comedy special called Taller on TV, which is now available on Amazon, but they showed it on Showtime. So that was thrilling because everybody I knew was in the audience, like everybody in the audience I knew because I had invited them. And um, so that was thrilling. But my two favorite shows, I got to open for Bob Hope in Indianapolis in the mid 90s in front of 5,000 people in a tent outside. And I got to meet Bob Hope. I mean, Bob Hope. That's and incredible. And then, um, then my other favorite show, there's no rhyme or reason to this, Laura. I, um, it was in a basement at a, at a, 
an Italian restaurant in Dearborn, Michigan on like a Friday night and there were eight people there. And wow. For some reason, it sticks in my memory because it was the first time I felt like I am actually funny in the moment. And we all had inside jokes. Like there were many callbacks and a callback is like an inside joke because everybody's in on it. And it just felt like I created this community of eight people plus the wait staff. The wait staff was probably bigger than the audience. <laughs> but I felt like I created this little community which feels really good. It feels really good to laugh with other people. Like I've always contended that it's very healing to laugh, but it's healing exponentially when you laugh with other people because you're on the same wavelength. You are connecting in such a weird way um, and there's nothing like it. That's incredible. It just goes to show you, it doesn't mean always the stadium or auditorium or, you know, it could be anywhere. Hey, we do bowling alleys here. So <laughs> what do you, right you, perform, <laughs> you perform at bowling alleys? We, we do perform at bowling alleys. Anywhere they let us make a fool of ourselves, we, we perform there. I, I performed at a bowling alley in, when I worked in Boston. Yeah, I performed at a bowling alley. I, um, that was probably the weirdest <laughs> configuration because you could hear the pins go down and um, I'm trying to think of some of the weirder shows. I was once performing in Vegas at a, uh, it was a benefit. It was, um, I can't think of the tennis player's name. He's very famous with the long blonde hair. But anyway, the configuration. Uh, Is it way back then? It was back then, but not, it was, he was married to Brooke Shields at the time. Oh, Andre Agassi. Yes, yes. Agassi, so it, Agassi. Was, it was his charity. And so the configuration, it was like at a hard rock cafe and the configuration was like in an S. So I could only see like a few people in front of me, but there were lots of other people behind the wall. It was the weirdest thing ever. So um, we, we learn to adapt as comedians, right, Tim? We, we adapt. We adapt. We, yeah. I, you never know what the audience is going to be like. You can predict as much as you want. You can even predict from when, the other, when another comedian is on before you how they're going to respond to you. Right. But you're never sure. You're never sure. So I feel like that's what the pandemic is. Like we don't really know what to expect day to day. Um, well, day to day, we pretty much, it's like Groundhog Day at this point, but we don't know. It's very, un, we're very unsure. And um, that's my point, I'm sticking to it. Yeah, <laughs> well. So Yes, go ahead, Tim. Um, so uh, my question to you is, like, did you ever have like a room, you know, that 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 you couldn't do well in it that you just wanted to go back to, like, like a revenge room? Like, I'm coming back and I'm going to tear this room up, you know, it's just like because the room was so either hard or so weird. It was a but you wanted to do well in that space. Well, early on, I worked at a club called um, Play It Again Sam's. And I had such a bad show that, and by bad I meant I just didn't feel like I was connecting with the audience. Like, I guess with my act, it's like a zipper. If you don't connect it at the beginning, it's like whatever, off the rails. And I think I quit for six months. And I then just had, I had to go back. It wasn't revenge as much as I had to sh show myself, it wasn't something to be scared of because it so frightened me that how badly I did. And I have to say one of my worst shows ever was in the past five years 
because I've been doing it so long, I kind of know I'm not going to bomb, right? Mm -hmm. But I bombed at this show. It was um, a show for, uh, it was during Rosh Hashanah, which is like, I'm Jewish, but I'm not very religious. Like I sing Christmas carols when I get nervous. (laughs) <laughs> but um, but I was performing for Jews, and they just stared at me like it. I didn't. I wasn't connecting, and I felt the same way. Where it brought me back to feel like all the reasons that I did stand up in the first place. I felt alone. I felt alienated misunderstood, embarrassed, ashamed, if if I know what the difference between those are. I felt the floor falling out beneath me, like all the reasons that I started doing stand-up in the first place is how I felt when I was bombing. Wow. And I I would love the opportunity one day to go back to that room and (laughs) figure out, (laughs) figure out a way to get them to laugh um but i had you know i've had bad shows where you just go like okay on mm-hmm. to the next one you forget about it like probably childbirth i've never given a baby, had a baby but um <laughs> but that show stayed with me for a long time because i didn't know how to i didn't know how to fix it at yeah. the time during the show or afterwards in my psyche. I still got paid though. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good part. That's That's the revenge, right? I guess. So can we um, uh, reverse that and talk about a show that you, on the opposite spectrum that you wanted to do, like a room or a place or, you know, that you wanted to be on and and you were there and you killed it and everybody loved you and, you know, uh, they was gonna make you president. (laughs) <laughs> yes we need you now <laughs> if i were president i would change daylight saving um i would make it four o'clock on a friday afternoon okay now it's five go home <laughs> um uh huh i I've, I've had great shows well okay so i would think i was telling you, Laura, in our pre-interview that I was hit by a car in 2018. And I then didn't perform again until January of 2020. And that was my first show. And then my second show was February of 2020. And And then the pandemic hit. So I really only performed twice in the past couple of years. But um, Tim, the show that I did on at the end of February, I headlined, and I during my time when I was in bed, recovering from the car from the my injury, um, I decided I want to sing because fuck it, life is short. <laughs> I could I could have been killed in that accident, and I want to sing. And even though I've ruined my throat a little from smoking stuff over the years. I still wanted to sing. Usually I just sing in the shower, um, only if there's a piano. But usually I sing. Okay, so I decided I'm gonna sing. So I run a monthly show or I ran a monthly show pre-pandemic called Locally Grown Comedy at Vitello's in Studio City, which is a famous restaurant in that that's where allegedly Robert Blake shot his wife. So Mm. I don't know if you remember that story. He went Mm. back, he went to his car and then he forgot his gun in the restaurant. He went back to get his gun. And then when he came back to the car, his wife had been shot. So anyway, whatever. That's, that's why Vitellis is on the map. So I've run a show there for about five and a half years. And I decided my comeback headline show, February 29th was going to be at Vitellis. So I sang four songs during my stand-up set. I 
I don't know if they wanted me to be president. <laughs> <laughs> but the love I felt from the audience was enough to carry me through the pandemic. Wow. Yeah. Can, can we ask you what the songs were? Sure. Baby so, Got Back was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been good. No, I opened with, and I was accompanied by the great Bill Sinkay, who has toured with um, uh, Neil Diamond, and he played bass and guitar and he has the most beautiful voice so he was my accompanist and cheerleader so i we opened the show with help mm. the song the Be beatles song there were three beatles songs actually because one of the lyrics is help me get my feet back on the ground so that's the song i opened with and then a little bit through i sang twisted that Joni Mitchell covered about uh, her therapist. And um, Bill had prompted me, he said, have you ever been in therapy? <laughs> and I was like, yes, as a matter of fact. Or I think he said, why don't you consider therapy? <laughs> oh, oh, man. <laughs> and then the third song, and the reason that I started the idea of wanting to sing during my show was I want to thank my husband because he really cared for me during the nine months that I was in bed. I mean, tireless nursing and just being there for me. So the song I sang to him was In My Life. Oh. And then I closed the show with an audience sing-along. We sang with a little help from my friends. And it was just euphoric, yeah. Before. That is so beautiful. Don't ask me to sing now. I was going to say. <laughs> we can close the show with a little help from my friends. Oh, really? That'd yeah. be awesome. It just but, so happens I have a piano right here. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That one behind me. But uh, Awesome. Yeah. Oh. Are I, you I, a musician? I know you're a musician, Laura. Yes. You're a guitar player. And a, Yes. And a singer. Yes. How do you know all this? Did I tell you this? I might have read that about Oh, my goodness. Uh, okay. Tim, are you a musician, too? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the most monotone person you ever go meet, and that's in everything I play oh, and do. True. It's because of his <laughs> unexpected penis in his birth chart. What, Lauren? It's because of his unexpected penis in his birth chart. I'm sorry. Hey, hi, Wendy. Hi. Um, Hi, I have um, a question. I'm really sorry for the background noise. First, I'm wondering if um, in Boston, you said you knew people in Burlesque. Did you know, ever know, work with Jesse Body? Who? Jesse Body. Jesse Body? Can you spell it? Wait, put it in the chat. So, B A A D E. Well, no. anyway, shout out to her. She checked in on me the other day. She a comedian? Uh, she is, a, yes, she's a very fun lady. Um, Are you a comedian I was one, too? I am a comedian. Um, and I have an invitation. I was um, wondering if you could talk about um, Radcliffe and being in that women's think tank. Um, what is like women's, I don't know, what is women's, did this change your perspective at all? This experience? It's a unique, yeah. it's, it's a unique experience. I think what it changed for me was it bolstered my confidence in, like a lot of people ask me what it was like being a female comedian and I always go, I don't know what it's not like to be a female comedian. Like, I don't, I never, I never thought of myself as a female comedian. And maybe that's why I wasn't treated like one. Um, I, I think it gave me the perspective of I can do it. I'm allowed to do it. I'm giving my perself, myself permission to just be a comedian. I think seeing these 
women taking control of their lives. I think that's what it was. Um, I don't think it had anything to do with senses of humor. Like, I don't think it changed my sense of humor. Um, but it gave me confidence. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank okay. you. Yes, I, um, I went to Wellesley, which was sort of a sister school of Rad Radcliffe, for those who don't know. And I work with um, a women's herbal conference. So um, it just is a theme that keeps popping up in my life. And I noticed that connection. I, to I went to that. Wellesley too. No way. Yes. Ah, cool. I know I'm old enough to be your grandmother, but um, no, I graduated in 83 and I was cool. the, um, the reason I thought I was going to be a therapist is because I was head of house of Stone. I don't know what dorm you lived in. What dorm did you live in? Um, tower, mostly. Tower, oh. Um, that was a beautiful dorm. So I, I was going to say, when you asked me about Radcliffe, I was going to say, well, I also went to an all-women's college. And I do feel like somebody once pointed out in my class at Wellesley, that we really only heard women's voices most of the time while we were there, except for the professors. But I do think hearing women's oh. voices did change me um, in ways that- I, I would agree that I, I experienced that too. Right? Yeah. And, and you said you're part of a women's herb, did you say? Yes, um, they're in, uh, actually at the end of September, we're having an online event now because of COVID, unfortunately, usually we would meet in the woods, but we're having a, a women's mushroom conference called Mycelium Mysteries. It's going to be online. Uh, so are we talking mushrooms like psychedelics? Um, we, we, all types of mushrooms, cultivating them, identifying them, death and grief processes, um, I think we've highlighted that in the past. We had Catherine McLean um, keynote, but um, now we have long lit wound and you know all types of mushrooms. Wow, um, that's like there's like a name for that. A person who is a um, mushroomologist. Mushrooming, mushroom ID, mycology. Mycology is what you're looking for. And I've yes. started learning about it. Yes. I've sort of been there, <laughs> you know, I'm learning about it. And I want to invite you to come and everybody else. But we'll oh, stop talking absolutely. about that. Absolutely. Wendy has totally been able to, again, detract from herself and go into interviewing <laughs> Lauren about mushrooms. Now that well, I know I had a therapist who was like, that was, she was a pilot and sh her thing was mushroomology or whatever you call it, mycology. <laughs> She was, yeah. a, she was, a, yeah, she was a psychologist and a mycologist. Look at this. I don't <laughs> even know what to think. Amazing. Um, so I know we are, we could go on for hours. I, I want to, I know there's so much that we want to get to in terms of what you're working on, Wendy, but I also wanted to uh, open up the room. So just, uh, this is sort of past halftime, but this is the Quarantine call -in Show. We're so grateful that everyone has joined us, but of course, Wendy Liebman has joined us, okay? So if y'all have a question for Wendy, um, please make sure to be the only one unmuted. So the rest of y'all, when you're not talking, mute your mics. And with that, who is, would like to speak first? Go for it. Can I talk now? Hi. Hi, Hi Linda. Hi, Hi there. Hi. I want to know, what are the top things you want to tell young comics behind you? <sighs> young comics. Do you mean people who haven't started yet or like people who are thinking about going into comedy? No, people that are younger than you in comedy. What, what advice from your experience would you say you had no idea was part of comedy that you want to just impart? Um, to perform as much as humanly possible, which now is a little more challenging because of this climate and to write all the time like I wish somebody had given me that advice 
said I should try new material all the time because now I do it on Twitter. Um, but at, when I first started, I was very protective of my jokes <laughs> and I wanted to make sure they all worked every time. <laughs> so I got stuck in a rut, I think. So that's what I would tell comedians now is to take more, to take risks because you'll be, you'll be okay. Um, yeah, you need more, more to talk about. And I do think that this whole experience of doing stand-up comedy or being a person in general is finding your voice, both how you say things and what you want to say. And I think I've pretty much perfected the how I say things. And I'm still in that other phase of what exactly am I trying to say here? And I think Laura, as you mentioned, I'm doing my daily updates. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm getting closer to that. I'm using humor throughout my daily updates, but I really want to say more things like more philosophical and helpful things. Can we talk you a little bit about this project? I'm sorry, Linda, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just wanted to say something cheesy. <laughs> Um, you spoke about being Jewish. I am too. Laura, thanks for working with veterans. I'm a veteran. Anyway, um, do you wear the jacket because uh, it, you're from the tribe of Levi? <laughs> Very oh, nice. <laughs> Very nice. Thank, Thank you for your service, Linda. Thank you. Wendy, do Thank you want to talk a little bit about what you're working on? Because it's a big thing. It's a big thing. <gasps> Well, I am, uh, in addition to my daily updates and doing my Zoom shows, I am writing a musical about three stand-up comics. And I play the piano, but I wouldn't consider myself a musician. But I have to say that four of the songs just came to me. Like, I don't want to sound like a total nut. No, that's real. But I don't remember writing them. Like if you had said, when did you write those? I know it was years ago. And uh, now I'm working on the script. And my husband, who's also, who is a musician, he's going to help me with the music as well. And so um, it's called Home on Tuesday, because for years I would always be on the road, but I would then know that I was going to be home on Tuesday. So if I had to make a dentist appointment, I'll, I would say, oh, let's do it on Tuesday because I'll be home on Tuesday. So that's what I'm working on. And, you know, I, thanks for reminding me because I, I think I told you in our pre-interview that I, I'm one of these people who has, starts a lot of things and I don't really complete a lot of things, but I want to complete this one. I can't wait. I can't wait. Thank you. So who's next? Who else has a question? Hi, this is Gail. I do have a question. Can you hear me? Hi, Gail. Hey, Wendy. So I'd like to know how you got locally grown comedy started. You know, what, what was the impetus for that? And how did you pull that together? By the way, everyone, anyone in California, as soon as this gets back, it, I hope you guys come back. It's a great show, but I'm kind of curious how you got that all started. Thank you, Gail. And Gail has been on Locally Grown Comedy and was so funny. She <laughs> hit it out of the park. Um, so I decided that I didn't want to travel as much. And I thought, what can I do to ensure that. So I thought, oh, I should open my own room in California. So we lived around the corner at the time from Vitello's. And oh, wow. I just walked in there one day and asked the manager if they had ever considered doing a comedy room. And I know they had had a comedy room there once that I had performed at, but there were they had trouble getting anybody in there at the time. So 
I just walked in at the right time because they had had a trouble. Usually it's like a jazz club and they had a trouble with the neighbors saying that it was too loud. So they needed to do something that was a little quieter than the music. And uh, yeah, so it was, a, it was a whole confluence of right time, right question. And uh, I said I was gonna work my ass off to get people in there because the um, manager said, well, we can't ever get anybody in here for a comedy show. So I charged $5. And I literally walked around the neighborhood and put flyers in everybody's mailbox. Wow. And we sold it out. It was like sold out. And then over the years I've raised it, I think it was $15 by the time we um, stopped uh, before the pandemic. But um, I don't know. It's like a, it, there was like a, a missing piece of LA comedy where older comedians loved getting together at the shows and just hanging backstage. Um, and then the audience became like this little community where they would come every month. It wasn't, wasn't a weekly show. That would, that would have been too intense. But because it was once a month, it was like the place people met up. And it really was just a wonderful a wonderful show. And so, and I had everybody from George Lopez to Tig Notaro to Arsenio Hall to <laughs> Nikki Glaser to Helen Hong to Steve Byrne. I, I have had every comedian on except Linda Marcus Smith <laughs> and Tim. <laughs> yes, I respect that hustle. I gotta say, Tim is the man when it comes to that kind of thing. So it's very, exciting to hear that you did that too. Yeah, so does that answer your question, Gail? Oh, she's muted. But yeah, I also, when, when people have asked me like, what do I tell younger comedians? Start your own room because if you can't find a place to perform, if you could start your own room and then you have a place to perform. That's that is my, awesome. That is That's what you did, philosophy. Tim, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm saying because uh, where we live at, uh, you know, there was comedy in the area, but people would come and just take comedy to other places. I'm like, well, why are we ain't doing shows here? You know, if we got comedy here and people want comedy, why don't we just do shows here? So I started doing that, and, you know what I mean? And, you know, and then, you know, I'm inspiring Great. to be you. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> you know how it is in Northampton, Massachusetts. Like I was saying to you yesterday, like Northampton, Massachusetts is no joke. It's hard. It's hard doing comedy in Northampton. Why is that though? Because is it well, that people don't have a sense of humor about things there? Yep. <laughs> well, well, people are so PC here. Like they just wait. They come to just wait to see what they can walk out and petition about. That's why they come. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Why yeah, they, they stay is because they laugh. You know what I mean? They come to petition, they stay because we funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it was Steve Martin who said, be so funny they can't deny yeah. you. Right, but. So, yeah. well, good for you. Good for you, Tim. So let's, um, so you, you're doing the Zoom show right now. How, how did you find, let me, let me ask you, how did you like deal with the transition? Like when everything stopped? You know, like when, because uh, I know as soon as the pandemic came, all my shows dried up, everything dried up. So how did you deal? I know you said you're doing the Zoom, but immediately, like, take me to that point when you just started, people started pulling back from comedy because they were scared, you know, of COVID, which they should be. Um, and take me to that process, like that moment as things started transitioning for you. Well, as I said, I had been home for so long prior to that mm -hmm. with my broken leg that um, I was used to being at home. So I had heard about Jackie Cation, comedian who works a lot with Maria Bamford. Jackie was doing a show and I asked if I could, I asked what time it was. I said, is it five? And it was like one of these who's on first things 
she thought I wanted to do five minutes. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to go. But anyway, I ended up, that was my first Zoom show. And it was challenging because nobody knew what was, how to do it yet. It was like really early on. So now I've done about 20 and sometimes the audience is muted. Sometimes it's not muted. Sometimes some people are muted. Um, sometimes I can see the whole audience. Sometimes I can't see anybody. It's all different. And I just have to roll with it like we learned at the beginning of our career how to do press, how to travel. It's just one more skill that I'm learning now how to do as a stand-up comedian. And I like sitting down, <laughs> doing stand-up sitting down. I <laughs> like that part. So, um, yeah, but what do you mean like, like how did I deal thinking, oh, I'm never gonna work again? Right, or, right. Yeah, so I immediately signed up for Cameo, which is where somebody can say, can you say happy birthday to my sister, Lori? And then they pay you a little bit of money. So I immediately signed up for that. And um, yeah, I, I look for other ways. That's why I was saying how I thought, oh, maybe I should be, do uh, therapy with people over Zoom. Um, not call it therapy, like just say, I'll be your friend over Zoom. <laughs> yeah, I'll be your friend over Zoom for an hour. Um, but yeah, Sorry, we didn't pay you for this, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, are you kidding? Um, it is a scary time, Tim. Mm -hmm. Like I wanna, I want to echo that. It, it's very scary right now for so many people. Um, yeah, it's all, everybody's figuring out what to do right now. And there is a lot of crazy, like I've developed, well, I found out during the pandemic that I'm allergic to sugar because I've been breaking out all over in fat. But I'm just trying to I'm just trying to make jokes now. But I did develop something called Amazon Nisha. And that is when you forget that you've ordered stuff yes. until it shows up the next day. Right. <laughs> That's Christmas yes. every day. Right? right? Every day. Like I got this big box of books yesterday full of it was 16 books about minimalism. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. It's like I'm just trying to make you just laugh. Just going. Oh, you laugh. Wendy, you don't have to work to make us laugh. You're hilarious. This has been Thank great. You. What Thank are the you. things? Go ahead. No, you oh. go ahead. Well, I, I was going to say thanks for having me on, but you had another question. So. Of course, I have all. I have so many questions we haven't even gotten oh. to. So you have to say that you're going to come back sometime so we can catch up some more. I'll um, come back. Great, great. What are some uh, platforms that we can boost for you, get you paid something, um, places to go, see? So not to get me paid, but I am on uh, Twitter and at Wendy Liebman, L-I-E-B-M-A-N. And I am on Instagram and Facebook and I am on Cameo now, as I mentioned. Um, and I know uh, Linda single-handedly kept me in cameo, employed in Cameo. She had me say hi to everybody in her family. <laughs> <laughs> That's Thank great. you, Linda. That is great. So, We're going to have yeah. to do that for Boney. We're going to have to call you. We're going to have to have her call Boney and be like, oh, yeah. how'd the move go? <laughs> yes, ask her about what she was drinking yesterday. Oh, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> well, are there any more questions before we close out with a song? Um, my question is to Lauren, uh, let me know about your fungi expedition. Um, I am so excited to share it with you and everybody who's curious about my mycelium mysteries, check it out. Um, yeah. Oh, thank Great. you so much for for yeah for being here for thank you thank you
And Lauren just became a robot somehow. Yeah. Right all the time. Listen, Lauren is like our wild card. Like, we never know where she's going to be. We got to just put pins in the map every week. You know, so like, <laughs> Where's Lauren? <laughs> yeah, she's just I out hope, somewhere. I hope you feel better soon, Lauren. I know you've been on a trip today, so I hope you start to feel better. Oh, yeah. I was car sick before the, before the call. I but, know. But I'm you showed up. Sitting on the ground with you, so. Thank dedication. You, Laura. Dedication. She showed up. Thank you, well, Laura. Thank you. Um, so I just, again, want to thank you, Wendy Liebman. Check her out on all of those platforms. Cameo. Buy us some cameos. Uh, go to Instagram. Watch her daily updates. They are uplifting and funny and so sweet and genuine, just as she is. Um, just thank you for coming on. And if there's anything else we can ever do, just be in touch. Yeah, I want to second yes. that. Thank you for coming. You know what I mean? I Love appreciate you. I appreciate, you know, you for taking the time out to do our show. Um, I'm so glad I did. And awesome. I got to learn so much about you. And you do have to come back. Yeah. I will. <laughs> okay. So I want to we... see your comedy too. Okay. All right. I'll... You might have to come to Northampton. <laughs> As soon as I can get in my bubble. To the, to the bowling alley. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I would not put you in a bowling alley. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I, I ain't going to promise that. But, yeah. you know, I can say that you won't be in a bowling alley. <laughs> we might be out in a field somewhere. But we'll be there. We'll be there. Okay. All right. So, love you. So, what song are we singing? Oh, with a little help from my friends. All right. So just so you know, Zoom is really bad about this, but we'll try. Oh, you mean because the delays we sing too much. Oh, okay. We'll we'll so, let you sing it. No, we're all singing it together. So unmute yourself. <laughs> Everybody that's unmuted. I mean muted. Lauren, I'm Gail. Going help, I'm gonna help people. Oh, right Gail now. is all right. Okay. So this is gonna be a mess. So before we go, just remember next week, six PM, we got Mia Jackson coming on next week. Ooh, Ooh. I love Mia. All right, all right. All right. Paul, ready? Would you think if I sang out of tune, would you, would you stand, stand up and, and walk, walk out on me? Lend me your ear and I'll sing you a song, song and I'll try, try my best. Best. Oh God, this is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, goodbye <laughs> with a little help <laughs> from my <laughs> friends. Who I get a little help from my friends. My friends. Get high. I'm gonna try with a little help from my friends. <laughs> Okay, all right. We did great! <laughs> Good night! Nice. This is the best show ever just because it of that. Is. That was awesome. Thank you. Have a great night, all. Good night. You Good take night. Care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Any U.S. citizen returning to the United States will be subject to up to 14 days of mandatory quarantine. Got that vaccine, third eye clean, we visine. Dancing off the top rope, we dug you off them high beams. Running hard like track meets, debutantes and back seats. Nice in for clear feet, my piss test with five. Double parts on planet Mars, they surf the net, we surf the stars. Quarantine in Zanzibar, breathing on the masses, paper like.